bist du sehr aller Ehre. Was ist Wundes hier geschehe? Dass ein Magd ein Kind gebar, hier über alle This is The New Right, a podcast for the lost arts, reclaiming the literary holy land from the heathen. This is Dan Baltic. And this is Matt Pegas. And uh, we are very uh, honored to be here today with a Mr. Mark Granza, who uh, is the editor and publisher of I Am 1776 and uh, I Am Magazine. And um, one of really the flagship publications of our sphere, which uh, is involved in publishing many of, uh, you know, the, the people that we have come to uh, our, our household names on our corner of the Internet. So from Ben Braddock to um, uh well, many just just many others. Yeah, Ben, and, ben Braddock um, is is a is a is one of the editors, correct? Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's been uh, he's been on board now for uh, for more than a year now, but officially so um, for the past few months and increasing. So, so yeah, he's um, he's um, a senior editor officially. Officially, yeah. Where's, uh, awesome. where's Mike Rosen? Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, Ben, uh, Michael Anton, uh, Catherine D, James Poulos. Samuel Finley, many of these former New yeah. Right guests, mm-hmm. Alex Perez, and uh, like generally, yeah, you you are at the forefront of uh, publishing uh, articles that are about uh, our dissident sphere, and especially not only dissident politics, but uh, with the magazine taking on the arts and uh, dissident literature. And um, yeah, it's just, uh, it's an honor and a pleasure to have you here today. Oh, thanks guys. Um, very flattering, thank you. Well, I thought it might be a good place to kind of jump off uh, or jump into to talk about the, um, the I mean, what, what brings us to, uh, you know, create these, these publications and talk about these things is, the loss of our uh, of the rights hold on the culture, and so from culture like literary fiction, theater, whatever, to pop culture, mass culture, the movies we see, the uh, the right, and I, I, we don't just mean conservatives here, you know, which you know, in, in an essay that, that was published uh, on, in I am seventeen seventy six describes as the uh, the right wing of the liberal consensus, conservatives, but uh, no more traditional values. The the conservative, the old, the old right, if you will, or whatever you want to call them. We we have lost the culture, perhaps temporarily, but um, yeah. No, how um, uh, how do you think this kind of uh, has has come to be and um, what uh, what are your feelings on uh, the place we find ourselves right now? I'm probably not the like the best person probably to ask how exactly we got we got here. Uh, I wouldn't call myself necessarily um, obviously an expert on the art or like a um, you know yeah. But I, 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 I've always read fiction. I've always you know been interested in cultural aspects of the. Um, in general, I guess you could say, uh, but I, it's, it's, I think it's a mixture of, of factors, you know, um, obviously, you know, the culture has gone, you know, the, the overtime winter has shifted left uh, pretty, pretty bigly. And so like naturally everything that's been produced is sort of like a bit of a leftist um, bent to it. So that, that's, that's one factor. The, the other obvious one is that uh, the right absolutely like, clearly lacks a little bit of a vision, I would say, you know, the same way people are like um, alienated by the, the conservative movement in general. 
uh, by the uh, the ideas that come out of the conservative movement in general, uh, they, this is somewhat tied also to their inability to produce, um, to the culture at large, to produce anything valuable from an artistic perspective. You know, it's just like all tied together, you know, this sort of like decline and, and spiritual decay that we're, that we're witnessing. Um, and and the other one, the obvious one, the obvious one, I think, you know, the the left has, has somewhat successfully uh, managed to infiltrate all the institutions. And so like, there's no really, yeah. there are yeah. no structures anymore in, pl yeah. in place to support, uh, fund, um, encourage, um, you know, um, yeah, exactly. fund projects in general. So like, um, you end up in this place where you know anything, anyone that has a decent idea that can have, that has really any any sort of like, um, that is in touch with reality itself, right? Because that's how I would describe. I mean, it's very hard to obviously define good art, but like you, it has to have like an like a natural aspect to it, like a reality aspect that reflects someone. Yeah. Human nature, and so those things are taboo. These Absolutely, days. You, can't about, yep. you can't talk about what a man is. You can't can talk about his, his deeper, deepest natural instincts, whether it's like religious instincts or like more like biological mm -hmm. instincts. Yeah, sort of thing. Uh, and so like I mean, you... people that have sort of ideas, they have nowhere to 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 express them and to turn into to something like a like an actual project. And so, well, there you go. Um, I think this is where. Yeah. This yeah. Is probably no. No. Absolutely. No. I think. Dan and I both really co-sign on the idea that, you know, not that not that art is any more inherently right wing than left wing, but that the situation we find ourselves in now is with that, you know, the sort of human nature, as you said, human nature, man's natural instincts, be them religious or um, just his deepest drives um, have become they've been made much more taboo by the left than the right. And therefore, um you know, right wing yeah. pop. You know, right wing politics of a certain um, bent, whether it's traditionalist or national populist, um, have you know become very, very, I think, you know, fertile bedfellows with 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 the arts and with a, a certain cutting edge uh, type of art, which I seems to yeah. be what I am seventeen seventy six is is very much about both the both the sort of traditionalism and national populism, but also the uh, renaissance. And I do I don't hesitate to use that word renaissance uh, of art that is coming up alongside it yeah oh, well, i mean so, when you when you yeah, can't no, say what a, a man is mm -hmm. you you can't you know you, if it's taboo to even say like that there's such a thing as a man how could you write masculine literature how could you write right. any literature at all right. and so that that's very much yeah but i, I think what uh what we have here is uh, a unique opportunity because the establishment, the, the regime, whatever you want to call it, they have uh, ceded the the ground entirely to uh, to to us, really, because you uh, you know they have all of these censors in place, which make producing good art impossible. So, uh, like as you uh, you put forth in uh, I am 1776 and in essays by Perez and essays by um, uh, well, uh, Aeneas Tacitus Minor and, yeah. and other other people. Uh, it's a, an incredible opportunity to grab the real artists and pull them to our side. And this is happening because they want a place to create and they can't do it there. So artists from across the political spectrum are drawn to our thing because it's the place where they can make art, I think. Yeah, totally. Yeah, totally. Uh, uh, personally, like I would, I, I would really like kind of, sort of like stumble across, like find myself like randomly sort of like um making this um art and literature side of the project sort of like uh, more central to a project. You know, I wasn't planned. Uh, I think you guys were asking yesterday. You know, um, um what exactly it was, and I said, you know, it was, it was it was actually an interview with Mike Kant, and I connect, I conducted like. More than a year ago now, or roughly a year ago now, um, which are uh, so like received, like I was kind of shocked to see how, how much of how much feedback and how much discussion that little segment where I asked him about the rights and ability to produce art and why it's that, why do you think it if it, it is, and he went on to talk about the patronage uh networks and so like um right. um all the problems associated with the institutional side of the the artistic 
cre creativity, output, and politics. And so, yeah, it came out of that. So um, I we, we, we decided to dedicate our first print edition to that. And uh, I think the response is pretty positive. And, you know, you saw other projects, like um, uh, also after the interview, like people like Loma started his own uh, passage price. And and um, and I, a lot yeah. more people still talking about this. So I don't know really like how, how far we can take this. I don't know really. I, I, there's certainly there's certainly is potential. Uh, and there's, there's obviously a lot of like people that are alienated, you know, and also like the, you know, the, 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 the cultural takeover by, by the left of all institution or art, artistic production. So like, is, uh, I think it's, uh, it's about to backfire pretty, pretty harshly, pretty hard. Yeah. Or maybe already like, is. Yeah. 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 You see like, uh, like, uh, you know, I really kind of like stop watching like new movies coming out, but the, the, those few, you know, sometimes, you know, I'm brain that's so why I want to watch like some dumb movies, like uh, out of Netflix, Netflix or whatever. They really like border on, uh, on fantasy. Like, yeah. you know, they're so yeah. like, out of touch with reality, so politicized, but also like in a bad, in a bad way. Uh, well, I yeah. guess all politicized art is really bad, but they're really bored around fantasy, like how, how the, the social constructivism or like cultural engineering or like Absolutely. ideas. And 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 so like this is this also like creates an opportunity in the sense that um, po uh, politics has become like our society has become so politicized. That you know, making a film that not not necessarily is explicitly um, 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 political because that involves into propaganda, but but it, that it engages with politics and it, you know it talks rhetorically like it references politics or like political realities or cultural war issues, is is uh, would, would be a lot more popular and would make sense, right? Because like it's really part of our lives. It's everywhere we go. Yep, absolutely. And so there's an opportunity there. I think there's definitely a big market. I guess you can say because like people, I think like crave uh, although maybe they might not realize they might not know it they do crave for some like actual art move whether it's a movie or it's, um, uh, even music or you know fiction yeah. uh they really crave for something that represents re reality i can really like touch them and and you know inspire them on a, on a deeper level and the really the crap that is coming out so it remains to be seen right now obviously um how much we can um you know, like yeah. I've no idea what yeah. I'm doing fifty percent of the time. You know, like every day since I lost the publication, I guess less less so now. So I don't really have like a plan or anything like that. But we got a lot of ideas, and uh, yeah, personally, we hope we can pull off as, as many as possible. And uh, I guess the the print edition was a was a beginning in a way. Yeah, it's lots for of a, and, and for lots a guy. Of yeah, coming together, you know, um, whether it's Amanda Milius or some of the other names we mentioned, you know, I think right now we're kind of in an ideas phase and with a lot of people coming together to collaborate. And a lot of the money maybe isn't there yet for bigger things like movies, but like uh, the people are making the right connections. Sorry, Dan, what were you saying? Oh, no, no. I was just going to say, uh, Mark, for a guy who uh, you say 50 percent of the time you don't know what you're doing, you have produced probably I mean, this is like I have it right here. <laughs> one of it's a, a beautiful you know book it's like mm -hmm. it's probably the the most uh attractive uh item of like you know mm -hmm. literature or publication that has come out of our side of the internet yeah. and so i i think like well maybe you could tell us a little bit about the um when when did you decide to take it from i'm 1776 the website to like we need to make a book. We need to make something that people can hold. And also like, and it's pretty, you know, I don't mean to like give it a sales pitch here, but it's relatively cheap. Like, uh, I, <laughs> well, I don't, yeah. <laughs> rel relatively speaking, like, I mean, the thing like, it wasn't, okay, it wasn't like, cheap I, to produce, so not Oh, wasn't. I'm sure I, for us to buy, I, I mean, like, um, I, we, we love <laughs> Lomez, we love <laughs> Sitchard. <laughs> But holy Christ, that was that's an expensive book. <laughs> oh yeah, Lomas, Whereas, uh, yeah, Lomas, I was trying to do something different. Um, yeah, yeah, it was obviously cool for a lot of people spending that much money. So, but yeah, so but, first of all, thank you, I appreciate it. Um, the, the kind words, very very flattering. Uh, and um, um, uh, how did I exactly did I um did, did we uh, we became um, did, we got the idea of, of getting into print? I mean, I've always actually wanted to do it. Uh, what I knew there was uh, basically uh, from from the very beginning then when we launched the publication, I knew that at some point like the next logical step was to trying to do something print in print. Like I didn't know yeah, exactly yeah. When, how, what's it gonna be. I, I have no idea how to do it first of all. Uh, <laughs> I'm late because like it took uh, a long time before we got 
at least like an, enough, uh, not necessarily income because we're not there yet, but we got some help um, um, by, by, by specifically Charles Haywood, the, really, um, the editor of the Worthy House, really. Sure, um, yeah. So it was, it, was a, it was a good opportunity then. Uh, we had enough, just a little bit enough, you know, for me to make a living and fund some, some kind of project like this. And so I started thinking about what would that look like? Like what, what would it be something in print be like? And at, at the beginning was uh, like we intended to launch uh, the the. I, Ines, I can never remember. Ines attacked this in minor, I hope I'm pronouncing it right. Yeah, this right. series essentially was a way, was at the time we were, we were planning on launching a publishing house, actually, which we still do. Uh, the website where people can buy the issues is going to become our, our website for, for uh, the publishing house. Nice. Uh, I am publishing. So, uh, but obviously, like a book takes like a lot longer than actually an issue. I mean, um, it's, oh, yeah. It's, much longer project pro process and also like finding like what exactly would the first book be like who's, who's gonna write it like it's a lot easier to commission articles you know that people can write like sh relatively you know, in a sh short period and then put them together and do something like that and so we started thinking about like uh, what would be a good um theme what would be a good topic and obviously the, the idea of dedicating it to art uh in general uh and then became art and literature uh came up and it was a uh, it was around the time basically that um no actually it was, it was a lot after our interview but yeah but you know the debate was there right it was like always like lurking beneath everybody just like kept about uh stuck talking about more like the cultural side of things and like, like sort of like the conservatives on the right or whatever you want to call it and sort of like neglect this aspect and so we wanted we thought it was a good way to amplify the debate you know which is essentially what we were trying to do really like um we weren't really like a lot of people maybe expected like one side of the criticism, very soft criticism in general, but we received though, like some people said that we should have included like most actual stories or like uh, even art itself, or maybe like less uh, articles, like focus on, uh, you know, more like journalistic side, but it was really about that. It was really about like raising awareness of the problem and getting more of the debate going. So that that's where the idea came from. And um, yeah. That was, like, nice. Nice. I'm curious uh, because the first issue is art and literature for dissidents. Is uh, that going to continue to be a theme of all the print editions? Because I know the next one is Florida, Blood and Sunshine. Mm -hmm. Is that huh. going to be uh, have a, an art focus or it will it no, be more? No, as, as the title suggests, it won't. No. Uh, which, which which isn't like an, uh, an, uh, a negative answer to your first question. Yeah, we're going to con continue to have to um, push and so like promote and, and amp I know amplify this debate and encourage people to, um, to produce uh, more, more art in general and more uh, fiction in general uh, on the literature as, uh, side of things. So that's going to be quite central to the project in general, but not every, every single issue will, will have its own theme. Mm -hmm. The second one is going to be on Florida, which essentially we're going to, uh, we're, I mean, we've got all the articles already, but we're basically halfway for the production side. Uh, just I'm literally designing these days and uh, still. Uh, but then future ones, yeah, we'll plan to return to it at some point. Well, an idea that I have is maybe let's see if we we we'll, we're trying to do like uh like I guess like you can call it art and literature for this part two sort of thing with maybe just like more fiction, poetry. Mm -hmm. Um, I guess more visual art or something like that. Well, we haven't settled on. Um, on idea for the next issue already after the Florida one, but uh, no, every single issue essentially will have a different theme. Um, we've got cool. we've got plenty of ideas, but yeah, um, obviously the, the art and literature after will still be central to the project. So I mean, a lot of people pay attention to the publication also for that reason, and there there isn't there, there aren't really that many publication talking about this. So we we felt kind of like a duty a little bit to keep trying to push somehow and uh, encourage mm -hmm. uh, revival or a renewal or renaissance. Yeah, or yeah. Yeah, no, sure. this, this Florida issue looks amazing. I'm looking at it in, on Instagram right right now. Uh, do we have a release? Do you have a release date for it yet? Or is it still kind of, I know no, it's not, coming. Not, an official, not yeah. an official one, but uh, I think it's going to go on pre-sales on uh, mid-November. Like, sort of right. like yeah. Oh, weeks. very nice. Yeah. 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 What, uh, what prompted the selection of Florida? It uh, seems to be a place where, uh, you know, everything is happening these days. Right. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, like Florida is quite... It's quite central. Like, uh, it seems to be, um, it seems to be a little bit of like, um, like a mecca for you know, like dissidents or like, uh, like an escape place for Americans that are dissatisfied with whatever the politics. Yeah, are. which, um, oh. yeah, go on, keep talking. Sorry. <laughs> no, no worries. 
so yeah, I think after 2020, obviously the the way the scientists handled the pandemic was very very, very attractive to like uh, I guess all sorts of people that really were like uh, you know um, hated the, the lockdowns and all of that. Yeah, uh, and, yeah. so, and then uh, the idea essentially came from like I was talking like you mentioned Alex Burt earlier. We were talking a lot. I was talking a lot with him. Um, it's like we had a few back and forth about this 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 topic of like the Latinos, you know, like <laughs> the you know Latinos are sort of like shifting to the right. Uh, yeah. I know, like, I, I, I feel like everywhere everyone publishes about this, like you know, uh, you'll see it in every book, everyone and all. But we, we were like we were like very avant garde on this. Like we saw this coming like more than a year ago, like almost two years ago. Like like when I when I first came across Alice, we talked a lot about this. So I always wanted to do something to explore this, like. Mm-hmm. For it exactly is flow, but also like a lot of the coverage and the, the, that it gets is very superficial, right? Like it's very like yeah, but the scientist is you not know, praising him, which he deserves it, of course. But it's like uh, Florida is actually kind of like a very weird place, you know, in many yeah. ways. Uh, yeah, and I'm, and I'm, and I'm, and I say so, as someone that I, that has never been in Florida, but you know, I um, I I re I see I I realize it now, like collecting all the articles and trying to figure out with Benjamin Braddock and and. and Daniel, my editor, how exactly to frame this, uh, and so uh, so yeah, we want to try and, and and explore the the, floor, the 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 various aspects of the of the of the state, you more like with, with a bit more like an historic and cultural background sort of thing, to to see exactly what what kind of. Uh, role you can play for America in the future. So that's that's basically the idea. There's a lot to dive into there because as you said, Florida is a strange place. I mean, there's a few different angles to this. What I was going to say a minute ago was that, and you're probably aware of this, Mark, but I mean, you know, growing up in the United States, you do not think of, Flor- I didn't think of Florida as a red state. It was actually like, it was, a, you know, famously a swing state, one of the swingest of swing states. You know, I think it, you know, you know, flopped from, you know, Bush, Obama, Trump, you know, back and forth. And you don't, you know, but it's amazing how it's basically become now like Texas, uh, you know, growing up, you know, United States, you always, you know, Texas is the Republican stronghold. Now it's basically not just Texas, but this whole red, uh, this whole Sunbelt alliance of Texas and Florida. Um, and that, you know, that is very, that is new as a, you know, obviously Trump, uh, Florida went for Trump in 2016. So maybe it really started then, but it really, it very much feels like it started with DeSantis in 2018, then 2020. Um, so that's that's an incredible change to to uh, you know to a place that was formerly thought of as kind of more of kind of like an apolitical swing state almost. Um, so it's the very new horizon in the American kind of political and social landscape of, is thinking about Florida this way. But I'm very much into it. And then even just aesthetically, Florida is a weird place. I don't know if you've seen like you know the Harmony Korean movie Spring Breakers and all this. Oh, I uh, love it. It's so, one of my favorite. Yeah, yeah, it's excellent. And you know, there's there's all these weird elements to florida that you know now kind of compare and contrast with its newfound basedness um and i think just obviously aesthetically it's great the miami vaporwave thing has always been kind of a part of these right-wing aesthetics um lots to dive into both aesthetically and uh you know politically yeah totally the aesthetic aspect of course is very central to to i am in general that's that's mostly because like that that you know that's that's actually my main input i would say about I, I rarely, you know, I, I happen to have published an article, like actually the first article that I wrote myself for the publication, but usually I'm kind of like more like, so like behind the scenes and you know, taking care of like the aesthetics and that sort of thing. So yeah, the, the aesthetic aspect of Florida is very, is very attractive to me. There's a lot there's a lot to play with, you know, you mentioned sp- Spring Breakers, it's a good move, we a feature project. Absolutely. Kind of, you know, obviously Scarface, you know, Florida yeah. Project, Moonlight, there's a lot to play with. Uh, and uh, as you as you put it, yeah, I mean it's a uh, it's very it's a very weird place. It's a place worth um exploring a bit more, but a bit deeper than the, the so like superficial coverage that both left and right really. I mean the left is yeah. just like superficial by by nature, but like also the right is really so like not really like exploring enough because uh, since this has become very central. So I think it's worth it's a it's a project worth doing. It's quite timely, I think. So yeah. absolutely, yeah. No, I mean, one of the uh, the great things I think about Miami is it's an actually like a red city, right? To the extent that like any city could be conservative, and and that is not to a, a wide extent. Obviously, cities lean more left, but um, yeah, it's like it's a city that it has everything that you know you want in a city, and and more. You know, beaches, girls, uh, nice buildings. 
but uh yeah it's you know it's a there's a conservative culture there. there's a uh, dissident culture there and uh yeah no I, I was talking with uh friends the other day about how you know if uh we weren't stuck where we are for various reasons we'd we'd all like to move to miami yeah they just had urban assembly there and our <laughs> friend isaac simpson in front of the pod uh said you know that, that place has got a pulse you know uh in in terms of like a lot of cities being sort of dead dead on arrival in america now uh miami you know has has a lot going for it yeah totally yeah um, yeah go on sorry uh yeah kind of shifting gears here to um back to uh winning back the the culture from uh from the left and so like we've identified that there's this opportunity right because like the tastemakers have essentially ceded the ground to us because they're too woke and they won't let people write anything anymore <laughs> so there, there's this great opportunity and i really liked um michael anton's article the tom wolf model and in that article for anyone who hasn't read it yet you should but uh in that article he suggests that what the right needs to you know recapture literature is a novel like bonfire of the vanities which is a great satiric novel that is a send-up of the silliness and the eccentricities of our time and not be and then one of the great things about bonfire is like yes tom wolf was a conservative and yes that is something that you you can kind of discern but you about that it wasn't beating you over the head with like this is the political message this is the political message and that of course is the best way to deliver a message is to have it be about the art and um yeah what what do you think is the um the future of literature for our sphere and do you think that the uh the tom wolf model the this this great satiric novel do you think that is something horizon for uh for our guys yeah, yeah um there's um the, there's probably yeah the, the, as, I, as i said before this goes back to um the the left so like making politics the uh, central part aspect of our lives it's obviously like uh um you know it comes con for their their very like emptiness of like their souls you know they they, they can't uh, they have no like way to uh, express or like um uh, find meaning in their lives and so like they get uh, very, um, you know, they become very political and ideological to so like replace their the emptiness inside them, and that that creates an opportunity again, like to to, uh, for people that are interested in politics, to, uh, or people that you know that are politically inclined to some degree to create some kind of uh contact that uh, you know there's uh has some kind of like relevance to the to the political uh, sphere. So satire is probably. It's probably a good idea, uh, for sure. Uh, I think, um, as as Mike Anton says in the piece, um, uh, the the problems obviously are are are, are pretty obvious. I mean, the, the essential message of the of the article itself was that you know we don't uh, you know Tom the real Tom Wolf model would be to have uh, uh, to either have you know a culture or like a, like an industry that that could afford people to to make a living out of their writing yeah. that we don't have. Uh, you know, Tom Wolf did. You know, uh, it earned just enough. You know, to to make a good living by just publishing articles. You know, like mm -hmm. uh, writers on the right, or just like writers with a sort of like a dissident bad, however you want to define it. They don't they don't really have that opportunity. So that leaves us with with the other option, like having some kind of like solid pat patronage network behind us that you know finds people and 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 fund their projects. And and you know pay them to write uh, and to sort of like transform um, whatever they're witnessing into sort of like some some kind of like fiction uh, product. Um, and I'm not sure we that we have that yet. Yeah. Right yeah. No. Absolutely. So, like uh, yeah. I mean I don't know. Um, I maybe this is your your full time and certainly you're doing such good work. It, it you know very well could be your full time pursuit, but like myself and and matt like we uh like i'm a i'm a lawyer so like I, all of this is stuff i do when i'm not being a lawyer so like 
I have that, that zero time. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. yeah. No, like I, I literally like my, my girlfriend wants to go on vacation and like, because it's, it's autumn and like to go upstate, you know, yeah. in Hudson Valley yeah. and, and what have you. And I'm like, oh, babe, let me see. I have a lot of podcasts I have to do. in oh. November. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> but uh, yeah, no, it's like, yeah, you know, finding the time. It's it's really a. I I think for you too, you're a labor of love. Like, labor no love, one's yeah. getting rich. We're we're doing this. Yeah, totally. We like I mean, it. This is like this is like one of the aspects. Like you know, it's uh, I think like because there's like there's so much grifting around. Like all ob- very obvious grifting that people are very very suspicious of anyone that so like seeks or claims or or, or asks for so like uh, some kind of like uh, or, or try to monetize their project somehow i was immediately skeptical about that but that's very silly right because like it's just, it's just so obvious the reason right you need to make a living right uh, yeah you know uh you, you need to it's, it's that simple really it doesn't really need that much justifying it's like you want to have time to produce if you don't if you don't really have like a big audience or like a big uh structural um institutional structure you know so like incentivizing that sort of thing you have to do it on your own and if you have to do it on your own you have to monetize somehow and so it's, it's pretty obvious that that it's a there's a very justified thing for for us to to um, try and, and and you know ask or or push for some kind of like um revival of the the patronage on the right in general yeah well you know one of the ways you do it not to cut you off but to, i'm paying you a compliment here like one of the ways you do it is you make a a, a product that is so aesthetically beautiful you know like i am 70 76 you know like uh you know that's how you don't that's how you sell something that people actually want and they're going to benefit from having you know on their bookshelf and you know that's the opposite of grifting that's yeah right and i think and i think that kind of like thank you again about that kind of like proves uh, the point in a way because like as i said earlier like, i was trying uh i got i got just enough funding for me to actually uh dedicate time to this thing right you know when i when i when i got to I mean, essentially what happened i lost my job or at least technically i wasn't allowed into work i wasn't technically fired but i wasn't allowed into work in italy back when um the the, the vaccine man oh yeah before. right so I, I i i quit i basically quit the job there and then, then I really found myself in position. Okay, now, now it was like a year into the publication, and like now I really gotta find a way to monetize it, right? And I got, you know, Charles Shea, Charles Shea would pitch in and help me out, just give me enough to make a living for a little bit and dedicate time to this project. And something came out of it, right? Because I actually got time to the, I got the, and not the, the exact amount of time that I needed to dedicate this to the project. If I, if I didn't have that sort of thing, it would never, would have never happened, right? Uh, yeah. Now, of course, right. this isn't to say that that it, it succeeded or like uh, it, it uh, like it managed to to uh, have that kind of impact that we we want you know our sort of like cultural output and artistic output to 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 have you know it's like obviously impact is also like notorious and difficult to to measure so you, you never know but um, you know I was I was going to I wouldn't have been able to do it if it wouldn't be for someone like really pitching in and be like okay now you've got, here's some funding that you know take your time uh, do what you have to do. Uh, fund whatever project you want to do for a little bit and and this happened right so it's really how uh, it really comes down to that sometimes uh some some other people then there's also the, uh, the, the opposite problem like maybe put some people have their their enough time and, and resources to do it they just don't have anyone to actually uh publish whatever they write or just like um buy or like promote you know because they get banned they get censored or whatever so it's uh there are many angles that you know that, that are going to be quite challenging but, but in general it's really it's about that not to go back to your previous questions like is satire the best way to um safely produce like, so really what the, what the main claim that you referenced um uh, tactics tactics my atm said that it's not really like maybe the best but it's the safest way right because like if you outright uh produced something like, as we said before there's some like very real and natural aspects to um to 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 its core then it's, it yeah. becomes taboo because the left trying to censor it you know they call you a fascist or whatever but is 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 essential is essential argument was that you know it's a good way so like to go after your own side you know like your the softer side of your of your um you know, exactly mm-hmm. yeah you you pick targets who the left want to laugh at and we want to laugh at. 
Yeah. And yeah. that is like, that's the way to bring everyone together and kind of slide it in into yeah. the, the so obviously you know, it's sufficient on its own. I mean, it can be all everything that all that we do because it's just, I mean, it's an aspect of it, but like it has to be much, much broader. And the other, the other, the other way to go about this is really, um, this is, I think we, 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 we attempt to do so like the same with a publication. Like, you, you know, if you go through our archives, you, you rarely find something that really engages with a cultural war discourse, right? Uh, we try to go a little bit deeper, but we try to avoid like very, very, um, first of because I think like cultural war, uh, most of like the cultural war discourse and thing going on there is like, it's mostly like distraction. And, it, and, it, and the other, and the other problem with it is it's sort of like the people engaged in this, they have the same like underlying assumption and in the same underlying predisposition, the same really underlying uh, modes of thinking in a way. And so I think we need to go beyond that. And 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 and, and I think Loma said that in an interview recently published. I mean, if uh, if a, there's a successful revival of like the arts on the on the right or just like proper arts, not necessarily politically, uh, it won't be it won't be the, the liberals, they won't be really, they won't even notice it, right? Because it will it will confuse them because he uses a kind of like aesthetic and, and rhetoric and, and ideas that they go beyond their their very like superficial discourse in general. Um absolutely. So. Yeah, no, I mean I think that is the model going forward. And it's like it's a great way to uh, bring you know, new readers in and, uh, you know, I guess red pill them in a way, you know, you bring them in with the satire and then you kind of bring them uh, onto our side. So, um, yeah, I, I wrote a satiric novel, Nutcranker, which is coming out soon. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, yeah, coming out from Terror House Press. Uh, Terror House Press, yeah. Terror oh, House yeah. is publishing it. And uh, yeah, that was kind of my... Um, the, the way I did it was that I put it and I knew that people on the left, like I, I kind of poked fun at a, a figure. The protagonist is kind of a, a very online spurgy kind of guy. And like, but, but someone who like, you know, ultimately, you know, you might have, if you are right leaning, you might have some sympathy for some empathy for. So I, I knew this was yeah. like, you know, someone that, leftists or people on the left or they're just in the mainstream would read it and they'd be like oh they're making fun of this guy and then people on the right would read it and say like oh okay well this is like you know it's we can laugh at ourselves a little bit there's a little humor you know uh self-deprecating humor perhaps but also casting our side in an ultimately sympathetic uh and you know light a positive light and that's something that I think is like a, a win across the board because like you, uh, you, you reach your right leaning readers and you show them that, you know, we can have stories where our guys are, you know, the good guys really. And, uh, and the left or whoever the mainstream reads it and they can, you know, they can have their, you know, their laughs and, you know, and miss the point of the novel. <laughs> yeah, yeah, or, yeah, exactly. Or, yeah. Or being just like completely confused that they don't have them. I get so many like, uh, um, like, you know, either because like we reach out to like photographers, you know, because we need permission to use a photo or whatever. Uh, but a lot of people really are, are very confused about the orientation of the publication. You know, if they're really not like plug leaning to the discourse of like politics in general, it's not very clear that we are like right wing or whatever. You know, if you read a statement, we don't exactly say that we're right wing. We say that we're actually criticized. You know, the goal is to sort of like expose the weakness of the conservative movement. And so sometimes you, some, some people read that and they'd be like, okay, well, this is something I agree, you know, the conservative movement. Like, <laughs> and then he reads some of our articles and then maybe, you know, part of them be like, oh, wait, what's going on here? Uh, but, but you know, I think we get, we get, it's a good technique not to be too explicit in your, um, well, for true reason, you know, I don't want to be too political because again, that, that eventually, uh, inevitably the balls into propaganda, but also because yeah, we live in times where you're, you have to be careful. It's, uh, you'll, you'll have to find ways 
to subvert it and to uh, to not be you know to on the nose right and to yeah right. no absolutely and i think i want to comment i wanted to make is just the strength of having a very it sound hippy dippy in a way but not maybe not in a bad way having a very holistic sort of message uh that ties into the art and aesthetics you know um something a lot of people appreciate as they're talking about you know experiencing art and literature beyond you know merely political considerations but also, when you get people like Dr. Benjamin Braddock involved and Rog Nationalist and you start talking about diet and um, obviously fitness and even, you know, a certain kind of environmentalism, not quite the same as like the uh, kind of New World Order <laughs> environmentalism, but environmentalism nonetheless, um, you, you know, that's always been uh, even before this current iteration of like the new right or the populist right. Um, that's always kind of been a strength of the more dissident strains in right-wing thought is that it kind of can um, have that same appeal that I think leftism uh, has for a lot of people, which is that it packs a whole holistic message about the health of the earth and the health of the individual. And that's something that I think our corner of the internet, our corner of the right wing and publications like I am 1776 are really good at leaning into um, is, you know, Having different, you know, people people may find I am a publication like I am seventeen seventy six, you know, through different avenues of interest, whether they're cultural or you know, if it's something that you know Benjamin Braddock is writing, it's you know, alternative views on health. Um, you kind of find your way th in through other things because people, for the most part, politics are not the you know, politics are good as as you said, kind of as propaganda to to appeal to the prejudices people already have, but to bring new people in, um, things like art and other kind of holistic health related, uh, you know, um, messaging uh, is way more effective. And I think that's one thing that you channel really well in the magazine. Oh, thank you. Yeah, no, I, I totally agree. I mean, um, the, the, the whole point of like producing, uh, like calling something art, I mean, it has to come for like a, like a genuine desire to, to express something that, that goes beyond the political. It is essentially a message that was, uh, uh, that I, that I, Essentially, what I said with the Kanye West piece, you know, the, the central mm -hmm. problem is that, right. um, you know, someone like Kanye, I mean, it's not probably not the best example because I mean, the, the man clearly has, you know, is is uh, notoriously uh, bipolar, so right. that, that obviously right. influences his, his sort of like art. But there's sort of like a genuinity to to his art, which inevitably like sort of like makes it very really hard to to uh, to pin down. Right. You know, like the yeah. best art, you know, even if they're like very valuable for, uh, usually very. Um, um, praised by by so like right wing people, they sort but they sort of like an, an ambiguity, ambiguity to their to their to their art, you know. It, it tends to be it tends to be genuine, so uh, it tends it tends to be yeah. explicitly parenting some talking points or things like that, right? And I think you know something like what the Daily Wire is doing is kind of like the other way around. You know, there's uh, there's there's some some obviously goodwill and, and nobility to what they're doing, but they they start. From the presentation that they want to make a political point and then they try right. to construct a narrative around the political point and build some kind of like either a script or whatever that that conveys the message and that's what i mean by the turns into propaganda where we actually what we need is uh is really to find to find artists that speak to us right uh yeah. if you find if you find something that is meaningful to you by 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 the very fact that it's meaningful uh it's, it's valuable right and then so they, they should what 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 what, what People that are interested in uh, in truth and, and human nature and and and, and beauty, they, they should find this person and, and value for, for what it does. But they should, they should do it as an artist, right? You yeah, what, I, what, I agree. What, what I said in the, what I said in the Kanye piece is that the conservative media, this sort of like you know, especially Americans, there's, there's sort of like this cult of punditry going on in America, where everyone has to become a, like a pundit, and so they find people that that are valuable from an artistic perspective, and they want to turn into political commentators, right? You know that yeah, get, yeah. get Kanye to say that he's pro-life. Get Kanye to say yeah, uh, no. It's, better with a scam. it's great that he does it on its own, but what we really need to do with people like that is cultivate them and make them feel appreciated for their for their art rather than political opinions. And yeah, uh, it's not exactly yeah, no. an answer to your question, but yeah, no, no, it's definitely that. related. I saw your Kanye piece this morning, and you know, I I agree. I mean, the stuff he's saying now is so you know, on the nose, but also clearly reflective of whatever state of mind he's in. It's, um, you know, he, he's much more effective when he's, he's, when he's more ambiguous and, and more, you know, art first. And, you know, it's now it's like, he's like a, a third or fourth rate Alex Jones. It's like, you know, 
Yeah, well, like I said, like Kanye has done exactly. We can't really take Kanye and, and, and take it as an example, example for or anything that we want to produce or anything that, that is out there. It's like the man literally is he's like a madman, you know. Yeah, just yeah. Just to say anything, anything about his claims, right? It's like you know, if you if you're going through like a manic episode, you can be really, you can be right about a lot of things, right? Right. But it, yeah. doesn't, make, it doesn't mean that you're any less, um, you know. Um, yeah radical whatever right so essentially what i said it was like you know i didn't make any claim about what it was saying but obviously uh you don't want this man to be a political pundit first of all like it was like the institute the, the political institutions that we have they're not really built for the kind of complexity right like i was like like you know if, if you're very genuine if you're a genuine person or so like uh spontaneous and trying to be honest you're you're uh, and that's what an artist should do right you cannot like have to you can't your your product cannot be too um, polished or like you know constructed in a way care, carefully constructed or um, manipulated to say yeah. something. You just have to let the message out, right? You just you're inevitably going to say some things that are wrong, right? You're like if you express your ideas naturally, it's like nobody's in the room, just with my friends. I'm just gonna say whatever is on my mind and trying to get you know the, you know trying to express myself the, the truest way that I possibly can. You're never be going to say something that is wrong ethically, morally, probably even factually wrong. Uh, but yeah. but uh, that's what an art should. That's what an artist to some degree has to do. It has to tap into so it's like this deeper, uh, as deep as it can possibly go into is like this human uh aspect and just like expressing it the way it is to some degree and so like if you trade someone like kanye which on top of doing that which he does i think is very genuine but on top of that is also it's also like very you know so, somewhat uh crazy to some degree <laughs> yeah it's just what's gonna happen it's like it's gonna backfire horribly so yeah I, I, this goes back to the problem like the, the conservative media doesn't really the conservative establishment in general doesn't really know how to encourage how to value how to uh, even produce art because of the creator, like he has this very, very uh, deep and 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 deep, uh, you know in, inherent desire to politicize every single thing that comes out of like an artist's mouth. So that's not very healthy for the the goal in general, in my opinion. Yeah, absolutely. And I think there's like you say on this, it's like the culture. And uh, I love Tucker. I love uh, you know our. He, to the extent anyone on mainstream news is our guy, he's our guy. Yeah. But like when you sit down with someone like Kanye and you try to like get a political interview out of him, that's not him. He's like, he's an artist. Yeah. He's someone, he speaks through his art. If you sit down, like if you sit down with like, uh, you know, Blake Masters. Yeah. yeah. Blake Masters is going to have like a considered, yeah, he's going to, he has his program. He knows what he's going to say. If you sit down with a, you know, a, a madman who's a good artist, he's going to, you know, say some stuff that's maybe sounds a little screwy, maybe is a little, you know, whatever. And, um, but that's, that's not his fault, really. It's the, the, the fault is uh, our society trying to make him into this figure. And that's not like like you say. That's not what an artist is. And artist, like it's very good. Like if you have a novelist or you have someone who can actually speak about politics coherently, that's great. But it's rare. Most artists yeah, you don't. don't, even, uh, don't even they don't, want don't think it, right? that way. The moment you like your, uh, the moment uh, you make him uh, really express his like political opinions, so you're also so, like dragging and you opening you opening him up to sort of like hostility from from. Maybe part yeah. of his audience that that just like this is art, is art, right? I think a lot of people like let's say Kanye now becomes some, like somewhat of a pundit, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. First, of all, first of all, Kanye's influence or like any artist's influence is because of his art. It's like it's not because like people like Kanye West and they like his ideas and they like his behavior. <laughs> and, like, yeah. And then and then they go like, okay, I'm gonna listen to his music. <laughs> Turns out I also like his music. So it's it's just always, it's always the other way around. So the idea that uh, an artist an artist's political view can have the same impact of an artist's actual political, uh, actual artistic output. It's just like, it's, just, it's, it's, it's faulty there already. But then also like, uh, let's say that Kanye has like, I don't know, um, I, I, we've been not coming up with a number, but you know, he's got millions of like followers or like uh, fans or whatever. Okay. Those millions of fans, they like his music, uh, but even though they might not really realize what, what his political orientation is, they just they just like it either because like they 
he speaks to them or they like there's like the rhythm or whatever they just like to dance to it or whatever whatever they, they want to do with it but then if you politicize this guy you're also like removing the possibility of those people being influenced by the guy or because like maybe they realize okay you know i actually disagree with this guy and i don't want to listen to his music anymore especially yeah. hyper politicized culture like, uh, like ours and so uh yeah there are many ways you can backfire you know and again it isn't you know i said in our this isn't really to criticize tucker right it's like it was doing exactly what he was supposed to do in his position right you, yeah. uh, you interview Kanye right after you know he blew up in the media because of like that white lives matter t-shirt and what yeah. you're gonna ask, you know what you're, gonna, you're not gonna ask him about like his, his, his religious views but, you know right. I mean, yeah i mean just to speak to the to kind of the art of it all i mean if Kanye had done that white lives matter shirt as a fashion piece and you, you know that's that's a form of transgressive art in its own right. If he'd done that and then said nothing about it, I do think it would have been more effective. <laughs> oh yeah. Yeah. Totally. Yeah. That, that's what, that's really, that's really what someone like Kanye does. Uh, you know, like it's not, I don't really feel, I, I'm, I'm pretty sure actually, because I've read a few of you, know, you know, I've been following Kanye for some time. I read a few interviews in the past, but also already back in 2018 when he wore the MAGA hat mm-hmm. and he really expressed support, like, um, and you know, appreciation for like Candace Owens. Right. Uh, like he said it himself, it was like, it's not like you know when he when the decision to, to to wear the MAGA hat. It's not like you know he listened to Trump. You know he like he like he thinks his policies are effective or his message is good. His plans for America. It's just like, what if I wear the MAGA hat? Like what you know? There's yeah, something- no, and that's yeah. That there, I, like I'm not like a, a fashionista, but like uh, no, I I get like I get what he's doing with with that kind of thing with the, the White Lives Matter thing. Yeah, it's like that that you can have that like in a fashion show and push buttons. It's literally just that question: What if I wore this? What would it mean? Leave it open for interpretation. Um, yeah, that kind of thing is effective, but yeah, no, not even to get too far into the specifics of what he said. It's just it, it's a little bit more. It's a little bit more of like a train wreck kind of thing to watch now. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, as I said again, like Kanye is like a, like an outlier in many ways. It's not. Not not many artists are where they're very like yeah. that artistic talent and at the same time can be can be a madman liking quite successfully. Yeah, yeah, no. Yeah. Uh, yeah, uh, no, to to call back to uh something you said earlier about how art is um you know, good art is not propaganda and you don't like with the Daily Wire, you don't want it to devolve into that. I think like a, a kind of good formulation there is um you want right-wing artists making art you don't want artists making right-wing art yeah, exactly absolutely <laughs> yeah. it uh yeah and so like i i think that's you know and that ties in with the kanye thing too like he's i i assume he is since he's you know has faith he's you know he is traditional in some respects some he, respect, he is yeah. right wing in some some respects yeah and uh and he's an artist and so like that's the like his art will naturally reflect his beliefs and like, yeah, that's, that's the way like artists win the culture. They don't win the culture right. by showing up on TV shows and no, saying exactly. stuff like that. And also, and also because like, I, I think a lot of them don't really know that there might be right wing by any sort of like reasonable definition of right wing. Like yeah, they might yeah. be, they might be actually shocked to learn that they're right wing. They might just like, you know, tapping into something very like, deep into their unconscious or like something potentially meaningful to them and just trying to express it like genuinely. Uh, and and then, you know, they might be not too up to date to the current state of political discourse, just like politics in general. And so if you really try to politicize them, you might even push them away because they realize, wait a second, you know, they start to get criticized and they start to get accusation of being the right wing fascist, whatever. Uh, yeah, you yeah. Know, you were built by association sort of thing. I sort of like that sort of like distance themselves. Like Lana Del Rey is a good example. You know, like Benjamin yeah. wrote a really beautiful piece right. on Lana Del Rey, uh, and he knows her a lot better than I do. But I, I also like listen quite a, a bit of Lana, and uh, mm-hmm. there's always like a very beautiful message and very um, patriotic, very um, traditional message to to her music. But it's quite clear that she's not right wing and. and uh, uh, not, not that she's not right wing. She's clearly not. She doesn't want to be right wing. They're probably not even aware that most of the reviews are right wing. I mean, she probably does now because you know she reads some kind of like notoriety and and and, and so like maturity that, that she's probably aware that some of the reviews are so like some of the reviews are somewhat unacceptable by general society at large. But imagine if you would have gone to Lana at the beginning of her career, and you know we'll get her you know on Fox News or like political shows and get her to you know yeah. why don't you like. You know, you're right about traditional 
a, a relationship, like traditional role of being men and women. You write about America, you write of uh, loving your country. Why don't you express, you know, love for the Constitution? Why don't you just say something right. about the First Amendment or Second Amendment? Why don't you, uh, you yeah, know, yeah. Speak, speak against the trans movement? Why don't you speak against the LGBT? Why don't you endorse like the nuclear family? You know, she probably would have dropped everything and just like become like some kind of like Taylor Swift, uh, virtue signaling left wing political figure, right? Yeah, no, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, like I don't want Lana Del Rey to necessarily go down that path. It's way more effective when the art comes first. I don't know if you're a David Lynch fan, but I would just um, on a the last podcast I recorded talking with a uh, friend Aaron Cummings about how kind of David Lynch um, has played this very well. You know, he'll say something that's like sort of sort of based uh, every like ten years. And then I'll toe the party line, but then his art kind of explores these ideas in a way that totally puts the aesthetics first. So, you know, he's another example of this. Yeah, I, I like David Lynch. I can I can yeah. speak as an authority on it because like, um, I, you know, I, I, I've enjoyed a, a couple of his movies like Mulan and Drive, mm -hmm. um, and, and a couple more. But um, yeah, he's um, the the seems I don't know. Like actually, uh, David Lynch always, um, always gave me the impression of like, um. Yeah, clearly that's you know is a surrealist in many ways, and, yeah. and you know there's, there's a lot of like gen genuinity to his work, but it was like it could, it was, sometimes it, it feels a little bit forced, forced mm -hmm. on you, like he's um it's like intellectualized in a way. But as I said, is I I can't speak as an authority on it. So, but but yeah, definitely there are many. There are actually quite quite a few out there that are, that are doing it properly. But um, a uh, they they struggle to find funding for the project, and and b those yeah. Uh, <laughs> Well, yeah. famous, they, 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 they're probably unknown mm. well as you were saying with lana and her songs just about like america and uh you know having a, a boyfriend that you love and, and this and that like it's amazing that to me to me at least that these things have become right wing like it's just being normal <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's just but, like yeah. it's just uh, yeah, like well, one of the I mean, like, like there, there are right wing. Yeah, you could take it to a right wing place, but like a lot of things that are just you know fifty, not 50, 20 years, ten years ago, we took as like, oh yeah, that's normal. That's what a normal person would, you know, a normal life. It's like you know, oh, you're you're a fascist because you want to have a nuclear family. <laughs> yeah, right. And there's this. Um... It's like insane. There's this kind of, I think, owl of Minerva sort of thing where now that there is this kind of, you know, um, as actually Steve Bannon mentioned this in your interview with him, which I think we'll get to, but, you know, the, the middle class, middle class America, the America, you know, the demographic of the Americana, shall we say, totally gutted, totally this declining. I'm not totally pessimistic about it, but nevertheless, there's been, you know, significant changes in American social life that have really gutted the middle class and that just like very normative way of uh, of living and um you know it's not like that was stuff was always right wing but to look back on it now in this kind of owl of minerva moment it's like all the all the details of just that normal lifestyle now um register as you know something that it has gone away and that we're nostalgic for and and that's where the sort of more right wing or traditionalist element comes in is that we want it back it's not that it was right wing inherently in its time it was nor it was just normal life in its time but now to, to look back on it and want it back is kind of where some kind of politics uh seep in um i was also on this last podcast i was recording i was talking about um how like uh rock you know just like american rock and roll as a genre was often you know, very progressive in in its aims and in its effects, but now it kind of seems like it's it was this music of you know basically just like the white middle class. And um, with the Lana of it all, her album was called Norman Fucking Rockwell, I believe. You know, it's like it's Norman Rockwell or Norman Rockwell paintings, right wing. Well, not inherently, but to look at them now, they are um, they yeah, they're like right wing extremists. Don't know if you look at them now. Yeah, exactly, yeah. exactly. You know, it's it's something that is gone and that we we want back. Oh, I absolutely, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. I mean, it, as I said before, it's like uh, you know that the the, the the opportunities are so many, right? Because like you can, uh, um, the the left has gone so far right, with their with the rhetoric and with their with the plans and you know, like cultural engineering that it's like it's really like borders, really on fantasy. Like you look at what what comes out that's uh, of of like the mainstream or like Hollywood these days. And it's just like not even a slightly being in touch with reality. And so like anyone that 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 wants to do that, that can do that, 
you know, is uh, is something that is valuable for us, right? Yeah, uh, absolutely. And, and, uh, now, obviously, the question that becomes like really like how how value like how much how valuable is like common sense really or like um uh, you know just like normal traditional uh you know life or like very basic uh, soft conservatism you know but it's, it's certainly not invaluable right it's certainly not opposed to our goals but uh yeah we'll we'll have you know we'll have to we'll 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 have to get what we have you know take what we what, what we can you know you go to you go to fight with a uh, you know, with the, the tools you have, the military you have, not the, with the military you want. So, we'll, yeah, we'll yeah. Well, speaking of fighting with the military, we have your. Uh, it was great. It was very informative, and uh, one one part I wanted to zero in on. Right, I is, missed that. What, what is important? That you uh, saw, like, cut out for a sec. Yeah. Oh, all right. Yeah. No, I mean your uh, your interview with Bannon was great. Right. It, yeah was um very informative and when you mentioned fighting with the army we have one of the the big uh, one of the takeaways from your interview for me and also just the takeaways in general from our experience in the past year is um you need a cadre of elites or not elites but people who are on our side who can go into the next administration and can actually make it an effective not that you know the first trump admin wasn't effective they did their best surely but uh they were hamstrung they were hamstrung and and you know bannon talked about this and so what um what do you think is the best way to go about uh building this this cadre of you know committed uh you know people on our side well, I think it's continue to do really what we're doing now. I mean, like what we're trying to institutionalize a little bit more the the project now. You know, it started very it's very grassroots. You know, it started like from from nothing, uh, really. Yeah, like, yeah. Like, from, you know, I have no connection whatsoever. So on my side, really, the, the how I can contribute is like to keep trying to push, find talented people, people that speak the truth or anything like very closely, uh, resembling the truth or like at least do speak honestly about like current. Uh, issues or whatever and keep promoting them you know just elevate them elevate their status really trying to bring make them more mainstream but, but making them more mainstream not like by taming their message down or like uh you know like um sugar coating their message or whatever it's really about giving them being more responsibility make them more responsible make them more productive uh make their ideas more capable of like you know infiltrating the the current discourse and that sort of feel like you know the the more we elevate people that speak the truth, the more they're going to be recognized by the mainstream, they're going to be invited on, you know, bigger shows and, you know, they, they're going to have um, some kind of like institutional power, institutional influence way to to influence policy. I mean, you see some of this happening, like Blake Masters, you know, although he, he, he doesn't admit it publicly and he shouldn't actually admit it publicly, he's not, he has to be careful, but it's quite clear that he pays attention. No, Tucker Carlson is another one. He clearly pays oh, yeah. attention to, to what we're saying. And so like, is there, is anyone is there anyone bigger than Tucker Carlson out there? So no, he's the most watched uh, person on so television. To some degree, we are we are creating a little bit of a cadre now. What, what Steve Bannon was talking about, uh, it was uh, yeah, it was more political really uh, than than cultural. Um, which isn't to say that it doesn't understand co- the, the 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 power of culture himself because it really does. But uh, yeah, he was essentially saying that you know we're. They, as he put it before, they weren't prepared in 2016. They were very inexperienced. They they just sort of like found themselves there, and uh, but yeah, it sounds like they're gonna be uh, more prepared now in the second yeah. term. And who knows? Hopefully, um, the people that are going to be close, the people are gonna be in staff if it gets elected. Hopefully, it will, and I believe it will actually. Uh, uh, they're going to be they're gonna be paying more attention to. Ideas that actually work, you know, to more, I guess, in case say radical or right wing or dissonant ideas, whatever you want to uh, call it. Yeah. Keep doing what we're doing, you know, keep creating content, keep like elevating, trying to elevate ourselves uh, and, you know, trying to reach out bigger, bigger audiences constantly. And that's, I think, the way to go about it. Yeah, no, it's it's interesting with Steve Bannon. I think, Dan, you may have pointed this out. You know, obviously, he has this now jail term he's uh, apparently going to have to serve, which is awful. <laughs> um, but that, you know, this interview came out, what, a couple weeks back or maybe even more recently. So it was very timely to kind of see 
his take on things. You know, and I know he he delivers his take on things on a regular basis on his war room, which I I maybe I should listen to it more than I do. I haven't, but uh, it was very very interesting to hear his take on what I mean. Uh, Trump has not announced his 2024 run, but I know that Bannon you know, is working closely with him now, or that's what it seemed to imply. That's what he seemed to imply in the article. And it, I think maybe, you know, B- Bannon's always the optimist, but this seemed to kind of give us a sneak peek into what that might look like. And not surprisingly, I think it's probably the most, uh, the, the the Bannon's vision of it is the thing that would scare uh, the, the mainstream and the current establishment more than any other. And obviously they're going to throw everything they ha- they can at Trump and at Bannon and at, Hopefully not at us anytime well, soon. Well, that's exactly what they're doing. Yeah. Within, aren't, aren't they? You know, just got sentenced four months to prison. I mean, it's exactly. Yeah. I mean, that's why I, I've been in contact with him for some time, and I was speaking actually just the other day, and even like after the interview, we came in contact for some time. It's like it's obvious that this is an attempt uh, to intimidate him and, and and to scare him and and to scare the larger movement that he represents. So they they are doing it. It's not they're gonna going to do it. They are they are doing it right now. Yeah, absolutely. So which is. Scary, but I mean, I I don't I try not to be too black pilled or, or or intimidated by it. I mean, even if you look, uh, this thing with Bannon is is just awful. You know that he's I guess going to have to serve a jail term. I, I mean, I I know I I don't know the ins and outs of the legal system surrounding it. You know, maybe he can appeal it, maybe he will. But you know, even just with Trump, um, I guess that what I'm trying to say is there's not total reason for complete pessimism because with Trump, when they the Mar-a-Lago raid. And all that, like, I, you know, there was a moment in the, the dark, mag, the dark, not dark, mag, dark Brandon speech in Philadelphia. It's like, oh, they're going to arrest him. You know, that hasn't happened yet. Um, Obviously, I don't you know, he Trump has a lot of, you know, he's has, he's going to have to weather a lot leading up to 2024. But, you know, I think that it's starting to look like maybe they really didn't have a lot on him <laughs> with that raid. And, you know, so it's it's more for, for, I think there was a, a lot of people on our side, maybe Cernovich, maybe others. Um, thought you know during Mar-a-Lago and, and and the stuff surrounding that like oh this is you know finally they're they're really serious now but no this maybe and I, I I don't know myself but like maybe no this is more Russiagate stuff this is more impeachment stuff it's more just you know trying to use any means they have to to undermine Trump but not re- you know not really able to do so so well that's exactly what it is I mean if yeah. they they hear about some anything solid uh, you know they're, they're be out there you know right now. i think so too yeah yeah i i think in some sense it was maybe even a bit of a trial balloon they said I me mean, because you know effectively the regime if you have the power you can do what you want you can arrest someone and put them in prison and you know we we know that january 6 uh protesters have not seen the light of day for a very long time And um, yeah, no, they did this raid on Mar-a-Lago and I think they will kind of want to see, um, well, how does the country feel about this? Could could we just, you know, lock them up? Is this something that, and um, I think there was, you know, a lot of pushback and not just from our side, just people were like in general, like were kind of like, uh this yeah. is kind of messed up <laughs> yeah i mean let's say like uh this is gonna it's about really to backfire i really feel like a, a lot of like a vibe shit in general you yeah. know they really what you really want what you really have to hope for in general this goes like politically and cultural uh and i'm not and i don't mean i don't mean to sound like an accelerationist here because i don't believe it's so like actively making things worse but it's definitely beneficial to us for the left to sort of like being like not even like pedal to the floor, it's like pedal through the floor, right? They're really like bent on just like becoming more and more radical and going after every single like political dissident and like pushing the narrative by, by any by any means. It's, I mean, you see the transgender phenomenon, the you know, the the the, the trans yeah. uh, thing, you know, the whole thing. I mean, it's just like just get you know, would you imagine yourself like uh, uh, would you imagine like even like five years ago that we would have this sort of like thing going on? With, with like uh you know literally like sex um shows for like children and and things like yeah. that yeah uh, maybe it's five years ago that's insanity something. yeah and I imagine how many people out there that are really like starting to see this uh and and uh um, yeah you really like you, what, you, the, you really the news to... isn't going to cover it like the mainstream news but everyone has twitter everyone has so you you see these videos and it's just like you know, you just, it's just, just shocking that, you know, the adults are there and they're like cheering this on. It's, uh, 
you know, it, it's a really, I think that's something that red pill a lot of uh, normies because they, like, I, there are people um, I know who are more, more normies and then their take on it is like, oh yeah, it's, it's, you know, that's fine. It's like, that it, nothing really bad is going on. But then I show them like a video like that and they're like, what the well, hell? I've seen the one that was published yesterday. Yesterday was like, I saw Christopher Rufo publishing one that was literally a satanic show with children. <laughs> literally a satanic show. Like they were wearing horns. They were wearing like upside down dress, a satanic background uh, and, and, you know, doing striptease for children. I mean, there was another one, I think today, I, it was some like British TV show where the guy just like, you know, stripped naked and started playing the piano with his, with his book. <laughs> Uh, I mean, it's just like, it's, you know, the 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 far the further away that it goes, the more enemies that the left makes. And so now, really, they are they are you know to go back to Bannon and what 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 they did to Trump and you know, the FBI completely out of control and all the federal agencies are really completely out of control. Uh, it, it goes back to the to the problem that they really have no other way to to gain political, uh, to keep political power, but just like using sort of like to stay in power, but just like really punishing your your political opponent, censorship, and you know getting. Uh, you know, uh, intimidate people and you know make them afraid of Luther's dog who's like using cancel culture. So, I really think like in terms of numbers, like we're we're winning so so badly. I mean, even the lockdowns, twenty twenty really radicalized a lot of people. Although not immediately because a lot of people were in power, but like I really think like twenty twenty four. And you see this, you saw this in Italy right now. Meloni that went from like two three percent like uh, ten years ago, and now they 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 won the majority. Uh, you're going to start seeing a lot of like pushback, maybe but uh, bigger than 2016. I certainly hope so. Yeah, I actually was actually, this is a pivot a little bit. I was going to ask, um, IMC 1776 was founded in 2020. So it was was your inspiration to to start it basically uh, stemming from a lot of that 2020, you know, that 2020. Obviously, you maybe weren't in the United States at that time, but like, you know, the the Floyd riots and everything. Uh, was that basically yeah. it? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, it was totally that. I mean, I was in Italy in 2020. Um, well, I've always wanted, you know, I've been, I've been more and more uh, paying more and more attention to politics since 2016. So I've, ever, ever since I wanted to, um, to do, um, to become involved somehow. I have no idea how, I have no idea how at the time. Uh, and so I, I kept, especially like since 2018, 2019, when I started like getting very, very, uh, disillusioned with a conservative movement. So like deep, dig it deeper and, you know, mm -hmm. to, it was literally like going down a rabbit hole, you know, I found a lot of like very dissonant. Uh, sphere with this like right, right. Kind of accounts and then you know more like uh, even like Claremont people and stuff like that yeah uh, uh, and then you know I, so yeah ever since like 2018 2019 I was starting uh, to wonder exactly how I can you know make it contribute I guess to the discourse itself I know I, I wrote a couple of pieces here and there but as I said you know I'm not really like uh, I don't really think I have enough like insights to contribute to the discourse so unless you put me like in a very like uh, normally like contents, then I really have some like interesting stuff to say. But otherwise, uh, I came to the conclusion in 2020 that, you know, it was really wasn't kind of going to come from me. Uh, I wasn't I wasn't going to be the one really like, because uh, I had this blog, you know, it's essentially I am 76 today. today. Uh, and but I wasn't I was completely neglecting. I wasn't publishing anything. And yeah. then like that, like 2020, I remember it was that NatCon conference in Rome. Which is actually where I recall seeing the first. It was January or February 2020. It was shortly after like Roger Scruton died, which I actually was quite into mm -hmm. him, uh, at least when it comes to like beauty and um, it was very influential there. Uh, I remember seeing the first person with a mask there. So it was like February 2020, and I started to get a really bad bad feeling about this year. This is <laughs> yeah. not going to go very well. And then the lockdowns began. And it was like very horrible, and we were the first country to enforce them. Right. Uh, and 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 the, it's sort of like one of the most really obedient, also like to keep enforcing it afterwards. And then the riots, as you put it, really like the twenty ten was just insane, really. It was. So yeah. it was. It was. It was. A, it was a, obviously an inspiration because, like, I I really came to the conclusion, really, really, the the conservative movement, and we said that is in the, in the mission statement that we launched. The very first week when I went onto the magazine, I said, we said, you know, conservatives, it's not that it's struggling or that it's, it's, uh, it's having a hard time. Conservatism has failed, right? It's done. So the yeah. solution is not going to come from like the conservative establishment. And so it was really about, it was really about finding uh, new ideas. And, you know, at the time there was all these people that I was following. And so I started publishing with some of them. And that's how, that's basically how I am got started. Yeah. And that mentality is reflected in the name, right? It's that 17, 17, 1776 mentality. Um, um, yeah, 776, uh, 
Uh, to be completely honest, I just like the idea of having a number in the. Yeah, <laughs> no, it's kind of a cool esoteric in in a way uh, name. Uh, yeah, I think number. Yeah, I mean, probably I, if you combine the two, I I really like I like the I am uh, because that is actually the initial of my old blog, but it's also like if you spell it, it sounds like an identity play a little bit. Like yeah, you know, I am as in my name is. Uh, so I, I like that, and then the seventy seventy six was essentially not necessarily as a, like an endorsement of the founding, which most people uh, think it is today when it comes across the publication in the first place, uh, the first time. Uh, it was really mostly like because I you know I knew it was going to be like what's going on in America is very central in general, like we we do live in some kind of like religious empire to some degree, and so like it's it was going to be very American focused. And, you know, there was also like the whole 7076 versus 619 project going on. And yeah, that's kind of what I always, a little bit of a response to 619. But you're saying it's kind of open for interpretation in a way, right? You no, know, it is. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, I, I like that aspect. I, I, as I said, I didn't want to be all right. Um, um, uh, how, how to say this? Like, I didn't want to be all right identifiable, right? In my, right. so like, the orientation. So, and as I said, I like the idea of a number in it. So like 7076 makes sense in many ways. Uh, so yeah, that's that's what it yeah. But I am doesn't stand for something in particular. Uh, as I said, you know, it's open to interpretation. Yeah, yeah. I, mean, I like that. No, I like that. Me, but I rather I rather keep it privately. Yeah, but sure. I but I do like sure. the, the identity play. So the, like then it's sort of like, um, yeah, it can, it can it's easy to say. You know, I am. It's, it's, I, I think it's quite cool. I like it. I like it a lot. Yeah. yeah. No, I like the wordplay as you're saying it. It's like I'm seventeen seventy six. And I mean, that's like uh, essentially a, a coded, uh, you know, it, you can interpret it as you wish. But uh, well, that, of course, is the date of the founding. And uh, that is a, you know, it's like I'm trad. I'm, <laughs> I'm at a very the, central uh, question. Like what, what is 76 exactly, right? I think that this is at least when we launched it and to some degree still today is like a kind of very essential question to to America, like you know, we recently, but I don't know if you guys wrote the Dark Age Patriotism essay that we published by Lafayette Lee recently. Hmm. And we it's got, on my list, yeah. I haven't yeah, read that one got, yet, but we got someone from Claremont to respond, Glenn Elmers, which you know, respect a lot. And I tend to agree a lot, a lot more with Lafayette Lee, but this really is about is a is a is a central question. It's like exactly what what what's going on in America today was like uh was like is it, is it a consequence of 76, 76, or is it just like more a, a consequence of people forgetting about 76 or not like upholding yeah. the Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. No, it's, and it's an open question. It is, you know, it's like, yeah. There uh, is a great uh, pod. I forget exactly who's who hosted it, but with uh, Mike Anton and Curtis Yarvin essentially arguing about uh, was you know the founding a good thing or. We, we all know Curtis's opinion on uh, representative <laughs> democracy. So he obviously did not think it was a good thing. But uh, yeah, no, it's, it's I think like even on our side, there's uh, a lot of um, diversity of opinion on, uh, you know, good government. Yeah. But, yeah, uh, wanna, but not on values. Yeah. We were, you asked me earlier about like future uh, presentation, what the, what the theme is going to be. An idea that we have is really to explore this question when I do an issue with like, uh, uh, we engage people in dialogues, you know, because we we're so like so like invented this form, and nobody else is doing it really. Where we get like like good minds together, where it's like zero H. Pilar, Frank Daniel Miller, or like Curtis Yarvin or whatever. We put them together, and you know, we'll have sort of like this platonic dialogue. So an idea for a future issue, sort of like having, having an issue about this question, right? Like the the seventy seventy. That's a great issue. issue. Yeah. Was, That's was, a great was, idea. The kernel of the horrors that that America's experienced to today, or is the solution? So that's that's very essential. I would say three things are very essential to the publication. This question, uh, the American project, uh, the art and literature production side of things, uh, and literally just like you know, obviously destroying the regime. That, that that's the number one, <laughs> <laughs> one way or another. Absolutely, it, we got to do it. Yeah. Well. Um... I, I did want to, not to keep you, if you need to go, just uh, let yeah, us know. But well, I, got time, uh, I, have a question I did want to ask you, uh, have you followed the uh, the implosion at Hobart uh, magazine? <laughs> yes. Yeah, I um, yeah it, uh, somewhat Isaac, a friend of the pod, Isaac Simpson, he was suggesting uh, perhaps privately, uh, but he, he was posting about it too that uh, it's a good opportunity for our guys to move in and take over like a flagship liberal, you know, uh, prestigious yeah, yeah. literary magazine. 
And I'm wondering to what extent do you think uh, that is something that is a, a viable model to uh, take over decaying liberal institutions? I mean, obviously, there's a unique scenario. It's not very often that your entire staff quits because of an interview you did with Alex Perez. <laughs> but, uh, but I mean, like, it just as a model in general, or should we be building new stuff, parallel institutions, or is there any chance of reclaiming the uh, the, the the organs of uh, the regime? Well, we should do whatever works, right? I mean, there, there's yeah. definitely an opportunity out there. Um, yeah. To for for people to uh, you know this this magazine has some some kind. Of, to be honest, I didn't really know about. I mean, I've heard about Me it. Either. Yeah. <laughs> you know, we publish. You know, as I said, I've been knowing Alex for a while. And we published actually everything that he said in the interview. We we pretty much said in the publication before, but obviously it didn't create any controversy because like you know liberals didn't come across it and lefty people didn't come across. It. We managed to fly under the radar for some time. Um, and I think that actually I know that interview was actually conducted very a lot. I think almost like a year ago now. Uh, because you know, Alex told me like very, a long time ago that he, that he was um, speaking with his um, with his with his uh, editor of the magazine, and conducted this yeah. interview. I don't know if it's a year ago, maybe more like months ago. Uh, but I mean, sure, we are of course. I mean, it's like you know, if this magazine now, uh, you know, like a lot of people, you know, uh, they don't want to be associated with it, and if she wants to like give a voice to people that people like Alex Burst, there's not necessarily right wing himself, but he actually. He's like he's very anti-walk in the sense that he just like despises yeah. you know what it becomes. So if there are people on our side that wants to try, why not? I mean, um, is it is it the only way? No, I don't think it's gonna suffice because I'm like a lot of uh, first of all, not a lot of like um, uh, you know, Alex was sort of like an outlier in, in the sense that as I said, it's not really like uh, uh, probably it's not really like outright right wing. And so, uh, for 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 an institution to collapse the way or the way that literary magazine to collapse, if somebody was like, gonna have to publish someone that disagrees with the leftist consensus, and I don't see that happening any like, anytime soon. But whenever it happens, why not? I mean, if if you have something that you think that magazine is gonna be interested, I think it's gonna be, it's, it's better than just letting die, right? Yeah, some kind of audience. So why not? Absolutely. But we, also to, we also have to do our own thing. Because it's just we can't just uh, uh, wait for for like leftist institu institution to start you know other um, you know creating this kind of like controversy or waiting for them to change their mind I guess so yeah we'll have to yeah. we'll have to do both whatever works I guess yeah I think that's a good strategy whatever works we uh, we got to do it we got to <laughs> take it back and uh, yeah. by any means necessary as they say yeah. <laughs> totally agree yeah. Well, all right. I know that um, you know we we don't want to keep you on for too long. You you have your your schedule. I think Matt needs to go somewhere. But uh, yeah, well, yeah I mean, maybe I'm going to say, but yeah, maybe a good place to wrap, unless unless either of you have further comment. But uh, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll let you guys uh, go, go close the um, either our question or whatever statement you like. Yeah, no, I mean, I think, uh, yeah, that that's a good note to put a, you know, put a bow on it. Uh, you know, it's time to take the culture back by any means necessary. However we can do it, we just got to do it. Yeah. And, uh, and your uh, IM 1776, that's a big tool. That's helping. Everyone should read it. Everyone should go to your website Everyone, moreover, should be buying these magazines, which are beautiful. It's, it's just really, it's the type of thing that you do want on your coffee table. Uh, I am magazine. The, the next one is uh, Florida Blood and Sunshine, I believe. Yeah, that's, and, the, that's the title, yeah. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, it's just like, frankly, you... I, I just like having it on my coffee table and you know browsing through it and looking at the pretty pictures because there's a lot of great photography in here along with the, the essays. So, uh, yeah, no, we, we love what you're doing. And um, it uh, it has been a pleasure having you on the pod, Mark. Oh, thank you very much, guys. It's been Absolutely. a pleasure of mine. And, and likewise, you know, I always listen to the podcast here. You're doing a good work, so keep it up as well. Thanks. And oh, thank just, you. just to be formal here, uh, people can find you, uh, you, Mark, they can find you on Twitter, but 
but they can also find I am 1776 on Twitter. It's on Patreon. It's got its own website as Dan alluded to. So uh, you're not too hard to find, but, um, but if anything else, well, it's, a lot, it's, a lot, it's a lot more work. It's, 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 better, it's better to find a, it's more value in following the publication and following me. But if people want to follow me as well, they can do that. <laughs> yep. Absolutely. All right. But yeah, no, really, really enjoyed having you on. Thanks so much. Yeah, thank Peace you. Guys. Mark.